So I, as you, most of you know, am a business lawyer and I deal with business owners. It's actually awesome, I love my job. And so a lot of times I hear, you know, you do your job enough times, you hear similar stories. And unfortunately, this is a very similar story to one I've heard many times. And it comes down to something like this. A guy, you know, and it's weird to say this, because the guy's a dear friend of mine, um, and he's also now a client of my firm. So a guy wants to buy a business. The business has a substantial asset. He thinks he's getting a great deal because he thinks he knows the value of that asset and then he sees a, a, a pricing opportunity, right? The, the asset is mispriced. And so he then feels pressured to grab this opportunity. In this pressure to grab the opportunity, he forgoes doing due diligence. And then once the deal closes and he really takes a look at what's going on, he is, you know, got buyer's regret. So let's talk about this for a second. He's got buyer's regret. So he does this deal, he sees this opportunity. Now let's talk about what he should have done. What he should have done is taken his time, slowed down, and he would have talked to a lawyer like me. And I would have said, let's do due diligence. And he'd go, well, what do you mean? What kind of due diligence? I'm like, well, there's two types of due diligence. There's, well, maybe a couple, but let's talk about this. So in this particular situation, we're buying a boat, okay? The boat is being run as a business. So the asset itself probably needs an inspection, right? There are people that do surveys of boats. It's like their job. Um, and for, for people out there who aren't boat people, you can take a big boat and you actually get it out of the water and then the, like the engineers and the people can, can like get a good look at it. And you can look at the bottom and you can have someone who's a great engineer look at all the electronics and the mechanical stuff. Um, and then, you know, if it's a sailboat, you got rigging and all the different parts of it, right? And there are experts whose job it is to like go in and look at that. All right, so that's one part. Obviously, a lawyer's not gonna do that. Then there's the legal due diligence. I might look at all the contracts involved. Maybe there are employees. I wanna look at their employment history, employment contracts. Maybe there's already lawsuits involving the business. I wanna look at those. Um, maybe there's a landlord. Maybe, you know, Basically, anything in writing in a contract, I wanna look at. Then there's the accounting and financial due diligence, right? You're telling me this is an active business. I want to know about cash flows. I want to know about expenses. I want to know about operating margins. You know, how much money is it making? And so if you're going to do it right, you're going to have financial people do their digging. You're going to have boat people do their inspections and you're going to have legal people do the legal due diligence. Now, all of that takes time. So what so often happens is you're convinced you have a good deal. So you forego the due diligence. Well, the old saying is caveat emptor. And when I mean old, it's Latin. And what it means is buyer beware. And so you gotta be careful with what you're getting. Now, at the end of all that, maybe you think the deal is so good, it doesn't even matter what the financials say. I could care less. And the boat, you know, and I, I, don't, know, I don't know enough about boats to say this intelligently, but maybe it doesn't matter. I can fix up the boat no matter what. Um, and the uh, legal, whatever, we'll deal with legal problems if they come up. And so then there's one more part I haven't gotten to yet. The actual drafting of the agreements. This is a lawyer's job. Well, what did they do? Ah, we don't need lawyers, they just slow things down. You wanna get this done? I've already got a contract. This is the seller speaking, by the way. Now, there's an interesting concept when you're doing contracts, right? Who's gonna draft it? Is it the buyer who's got all the money or is it the seller who's got the asset? And typically the person who drafts has all the power, right? Because then they're putting the other side in a position where they have to ask for changes. They have to say, can you change these five sections? And it's basically a negotiation and I can give on three, but push on two, but I still get more of what I want than you get you want because I drafted the whole thing. And maybe you didn't bring up every problem you had in the interest of trying to get a deal done. So these guys do it. And in this particular circumstance, they buy the, the company that owned the boats. So they're doing what's called a stock purchase as opposed to an asset purchase. An asset purchase would be, I just buy the assets. Well, here's the deal. When you do a stock purchase, you're buying every single thing that that corporation owns. So not only the boat, but the financial records, the client list, the intellectual property, the trademarks, the trade names, everything, right? Everything. And so here we are. They signed this crappy contract drafted without a lawyer, done by the seller. Buyer was in a rush and buyer is now doing his due diligence after the fact, realized the boat was not in the condition that he was promised it would be in, but seller is refusing to hand over financial records um, and it looks like we are headed for a fight. Um, now, maybe the fight was inevitable, maybe the fight is just the cost of doing business because you're getting such a good deal, um, or maybe the fight was completely avoidable if you had just taken a little bit of time and had a lawyer involved from the beginning. 
Um, in any case, I'm gonna fight like heck for my client, and I'll see you all soon. Thank you.